Hi everyone, my name is David Petrino. I am the Nash Family Director of the Cohen Center for Recovery from Complex Chronic Illness, and it is a pleasure to be here at the Aspen Health Festival talking about long COVID and all we can be doing for people who are living with long COVID. At the Cohen Center for Recovery from Complex Chronic Illness, or the CORE, which we're calling it at Mount Sinai, we're undergoing a whole lot of new research, uh, trying to understand a few different elements of long COVID. First of all, exactly what patients are experiencing when they tell us about their symptoms. We know that people are fatigued. We know that people have symptoms like post-exertional malaise, which are worsening symptoms after they exert themselves. But we're really trying to delve into the quality of those symptoms. What exactly are people experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis in their own words, so that we can develop better outcome measures to understand that. And we can also start to search for physiological biomarkers that link up to the symptoms that people are experiencing. Um, a recent uh, study that we have just pre-printed um, is very exciting in that regard. We've actually been able to show that uh, parts of our body called autoantibodies, these are antibodies that actually attack our own tissue, are highly prevalent in individuals who present to us with uh, new onset pain after long COVID. And we've actually found that these autoantibodies may have a causal link. And the way we learned that was we were able to inject those antibodies into mice and the mice went on to develop chronic pain, indicating that we can, the, the technique is called forward transmit these physiological symptoms that people with long COVID are experiencing into other organisms. That is a huge step in showing us that these symptoms that people are telling us are biological in nature. You know, there's no chance that these symptoms are occurring due to psychological illness or depression or anxiety. These are very real biological changes are occurring. And we, we may be able to then develop new drugs or repurpose old drugs to treat some of these symptoms. Over time, we're, we're getting more and more detailed into some of the um, physiological changes that are occurring in people with long COVID. So for instance, uh, late last year, we published a paper in Nature showing that individuals with long COVID were much like, more likely than uh, healthy controls to have low levels of a hormone called cortisol in their body in the early morning periods. So cortisol is a hormone that wakes you up in the morning. So uh, people who are healthy will usually have a big cortisol spike in the morning. That's what wakes them up and brings them out of their sleep state. Individuals with long COVID had very low levels of cortisol. So it's not a matter of just hitting the body with cortisol. It's a matter of working with biologics and drugs that might be able to correct the cycle. So even things that have a good level of clinical evidence in the past for addressing this, such as ashwagandha, which is more on the natural medicine side of things, could have a role in helping people with long COVID to develop more healthy cortisol cycling. Um, but with all of this in mind, we're always wondering, okay, well, what is the root cause? What is causing the cortisol to be at a low level? And that's why we've been doing intensive research into co-infection and viral persistence, because we think that this ongoing uh, infectious process that is occurring in people with long COVID could be to blame for the hormone dysregulation that we're seeing. As soon as we published this finding about the low morning cortisol, the exact next thing we did was we've engaged in a clinical trial where we're asking people to test their cortisol 10 times per day over a period of two days. So we can see exactly what their cortisol does, what we call diurnally throughout the day and do exactly what you said, understand, is it just low morning cortisol in the, you know, as soon as you wake up or are you actually having cycling issues throughout the entire day? When SARS-CoV-2 infects somebody, it can affect every single organ system in the body. Long COVID has over 200 documented uh, symptoms that affect every single organ system. As a result, it's extremely improbable that any one single cure or treatment is going to solve all of long COVID. And this is where we need a lot of collaboration between multiple specialties. Um, in addition to working with Akiko Iwasaki, who is an amazing immunologist out of Yale University, our team has been really fortunate to collaborate with a wide range of specialties that range from GI, cardiology, neurology, virology, 
And uh, we also have the privilege of working with the Polybio Research Foundation. Um, they have put a lot of energy into creating the Long COVID Research Consortium, which is an international collaborative of researchers and clinicians from every specialty coming together on a weekly basis to discuss ongoing research and to discuss ongoing clinical presentations so that we can all better come up with, with ideas of how to address long COVID. In addition to that, we've also been working with groups like the Cohen Foundation, um, the Stephen and Alexandra Cohen Foundation, who have um, been helping us to explore other infection associated chronic conditions such as chronic Lyme disease, myalgic encephalomyelitis and chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, these are conditions that we know to be triggered by an infection and then go on to cause years, if not decades of debilitating and very, very life limiting symptoms. And so we're really privileged to be able to work with this community that has a wealth of experience over many decades to inform a lot of the research that we do on long COVID. So we, we also uh, are doing a lot of research. It's called PANS PANDAS, uh, P-A-N-S slash PANDAS, P-A-N-D-A-S. Uh, often kids with uh, strep throat, they'll get strep throat, they were perfectly healthy before, get strep throat, and then the next thing you know, they're not eating, they start to develop OCD-like behaviors, um, they tell you all of their food is contaminated and they can only eat one or two things. This is a known syndrome. It, for the longest time, it was thought to be psychiatric, but it's related to the infection and they can be treated with antibiotics and they can be treated with uh, other supplements that can help them make a full recovery. Um, and there are a lot of really good PANS PANDAS doctors that we work directly with in order to get better treatment options for our kids. You know, people have been talking about it for 20 or 30 years, but they've been viewed as crackpots. And now again, with long COVID, everyone's like, oh, maybe infections can cause long-term issues. And yeah. everyone's re-looking at it and everyone's like, oh, well, you know, there's some really good research here. And, and some of these people that have been ostracized for their beliefs or their, I shouldn't even say beliefs, for the really good quality research that they did. And it just got dismissed because, you know, a, a kid su suddenly saying that, you know, they won't eat anything that, that's the color blue, you know, is viewed as um, a psychiatric problem, not as an infection associated one. But when, when you really think about it and when you listen to your par the parents and you listen to the patients, they can always detail it back to, well, it was after they got strep throat okay, well maybe the strep throat did it, as opposed to maybe they just coincidentally got a psychiatric condition after an infection, yeah. which is, you know, some of the minimizers in the field tried that early in the COVID pandemic, but there were, fortunately, there were too many, many millions for that to really stick. We, I think that there is a critical need to understand that long COVID and other infection associated chronic conditions like chronic Lyme disease and myalgic encephalomyelitis are diseases and illnesses that require precision medicine approaches. There's no one size fits all treatment. Anyone who tells you that they have the cure is probably selling you something as opposed to trying to treat your condition. And what we really need to understand in every single person who comes to us with one of these conditions is what is the genetic, infectious, and general medical background of the person who's sitting in front of us for us to understand how this triggering event, this triggering viral infection or bacterial infection has led to these long-term chronic symptoms. And only then can we start to put together the right combination of interventions that is going to allow us to properly treat people with long COVID. And in terms of how do we research that, we need to move beyond the standard medical single drug randomized controlled trials, and we need to move into more sophisticated clinical trials. There are clinical trials, for example, that are called adaptive platform trials, which use uh, very sophisticated Bayesian algorithms and allow us to test more than one intervention at a time in combination with one another so that we can say, hey, we know that you have a co-infection, viral persistence, and hormonal dysregulation. So 
Rather than just doing a clinical trial where we try one intervention, let's say testosterone, we're gonna give you testosterone, a SARS-CoV-2 monoclonal antibody, and a broad spectrum antiviral that will address the, all three things that are going on. And we're gonna put you in one of the treatment groups that receives that combination trial. And we're gonna see how you do on those combination trials. And so that's the sort of sophisticated clinical trial approach, which is non-traditional. You know, for the longest time, for the last hundred years, we test one drug at a time and we do it in a randomized controlled trial. And everyone with a single diagnosis gets treated exactly the same. Well, that's not gonna work for complex chronic illness. And we need to shift the way that we're thinking about it if we're gonna make any progress whatsoever. The main message I wanna give back to people who are living with long COVID right now is that help is coming. We have incredible researchers and clinicians who are starting to understand the complexity of the situation. We have ongoing clinical trials that are very exciting that we think have the potential to make a real difference in the lives of people with long COVID. And at every level of advocacy, we have incredible patients who are fighting hard for the rights of people with long COVID to get access to care, to get access to disability benefits, as well as to tell Congress that more funding is required to address this issue. Um, you know, Harvard Business School estimated that this is a $3 trillion problem because of how many people in the United States have long COVID, how many people in the United States continue to get diagnosed with long COVID after new infections, and the amount it is affecting job security and our ability to work. So where, you know, I, I want the people out there to understand that we're working the problem very, very hard um, and to keep the hope alive, but also to not stop fighting for more funding, more research and more attention to the problem. Do you see it getting better? I do. I, 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 I see it getting better. I do think it would get better a lot faster if the government would be more strategic and intelligent with the way that they're um, applying funds to the, the situation.